and and I hope that we can listen to them. And of course, in the eighties, me and you were toddlers at the time. <laughs> yes but we uh, were. what but lessons? You know, we are we are, we are here to listen to them. We are here to the consistency that the struggle has to be consistent, and that this revolution. the responsibility that lies with it. How important is it to preserve this knowledge of the real ultimate sacrifice that they took? It's very important. It's very important and, and, and the, the Adelaide and, and OR uh, uh, Foundation, uh, 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 this lecture is part of that. This series is part of that. You know, it's part of that archive of keeping that memory and making it available, keeping the lessons. You know, there's a vast literature over there that we can have that is available that we can access and that we can share in our libraries you know so it doesn't have to just be this lecture once a year you know the foundation is doing a whole lot of other outreach programs that go into schools um, that go into communities so 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 activities such as those are, are, um, are contributing to making sure that we don't forget and of course, uh, the legacy of Or Tambo, we have the Or Tambo International Airport, we have various uh, streets named after him, but um, I mean, it's very important that, you know, his name lives on. What sort of legacy has he left us? I mean, he left us, he, he, he didn't just leave us an airport. Of course, naming is so important, especially in African culture. Naming is so important because the children who are not born today are going to ask us, who is Adelaide Tambo? Who is Albert Sinasusulu? Who is Owar Tambo? And we are able then to share with them, you know. But they, they left us their courage. You know, and that is so important for us to continue on that same path. You know, they left us the consistency, you know, and, and they left us the undying Pan-Africanist spirit. Thank you very much. Uh, that is Natasha, Natalia Mulibazi, who is a poet and of course who says that uh, some of her work has been greatly influenced by the likes of Maxine Waters in her struggles against racial uh, oppression as well as uh, gender issues. So really taking uh, some example from her and saying that, you know, she's really looking forward to hear from her. The formal activities here or the formal event has started. We do know that uh, Maxine Waters will address uh, this gathering later on. But for now, I can say that, of course, uh, the event is set to continue right now and we will bring you uh, those uh, uh, those event, whatever is happening inside here as it happens and as it, 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 it unfolds here at uh, the virtual hotel.
Please welcome to the stage the adorable Navy children, accompanied by accomplished vocalist Timothy Muloy. They both will be leading us in singing our national anthem. With respect, I'd like to ask all of you to please rise. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. What we want in South Africa is that our humanity should be acknowledged, that those who are ruling in that country should pay some respect to the concept of human dignity. You have 12 million people in South Africa who are treated as if they were subhumans. In South Africa, I should feel that I am a human being in that country, and I don't feel so now at all. I feel I'm a stranger, a foreigner, and at best, um, an animal in South Africa. This is how I feel. Once, we were travelers. Wherever we found water and warmth, we were home. Once, when we knew the ocean's true names, you could send a beat from Indian to Atlantic, Giza to Great Zimbabwe, a scripted message traveled from heart to hands to drums to dust to ear to village to kingdom, songs of divination, songs of destruction. Coded 
connections contained in clan names and cattle, cosmic formations and the scars that hold both beauty and tears. Once we knew that a human being was more than a two-legged consumer, more than a permit or passport holder, more than a slave or child of war. An African in motion is a tangent in time, a multi-dimensional expression of lineage, a collection of talents mined through survival made manifest in transcendence. We transcend borders of geography, skin, and mind. We make empires out of empty spaces, create cultures out of chaos and catastrophe. Through turbulence and turmoil, we never stop. Like the flow of our resources, we never stop. Like the tides of our geniuses, we never stop. Like the forces that would divide us, we never stop. Once a timeline broke like a wave, crashing against the shores of limitations. Her immortal face, an army of colors, the flesh of the young, the wisdom of ancients, the wealth of the womb of the world. Hers is the bread on every table. Hers is the creamy milk of kings. Hers is the fat of fertile lands. Hers is the meeting point of minds reborn. Our borders will melt in each other's mouths. Our pain will find refuge in each other's tongues. Our children will find love in each other's nations. Our actions will be judged in each other's songs. Once, there was a place where men put down their guns and picked up the souls of their people. Where power was measured as the growth of your neighbor. How many souls have awakened because you are alive? How many lives intersect when we see ourselves through our own eyes? How many leaders will it take to make our continent whole? In the marketplace, we will be like mothers, measuring cloth, grain, and gold, like futures in the mouths of her children.
Once, we were travelers. Wherever we found water and warmth, we were home. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for the hugely talented moving into dance, J-Star on drums and ballerina extraordinaire, Kitty Peta. My name is Lebu Mashile, and I've been entrusted with the wonderful honor and responsibility of being your program director for this evening. All of you are most welcome to the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation annual lecture now in its sixth year, ladies and gentlemen. As my first act of official business, I would like to call upon the chairman of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Mr. Dumankosi, please to come to the stage and address us. and gentlemen, um, the Oliver Nadley Tambo Foundation is pleased to welcome you to the sixth annual Oliver Tambo Memorial Lecture. Let me start by acknowledging the struggle veteran and easy to land where Mama Sophie Dubrain The patron of our Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Joel Neti Denze. We do have members of the Lutuli Detachment who are here. Can we acknowledge them? The Nigerian Ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Kabiru Bala. The Namibian Ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency uh, Niwete. The Zimbabwean Ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency David Mahindripi. So we do have South African stalwarts here as well from the ANC. We do actually have as well um, yourself as honorable guests, uh, viewers that may be listening at home and joining us in the evening, you are all welcome. I do not doubt in his self-effacing and humble manner, Oliver Tambo would be pleased and somewhat surprised that this esteemed audience has gathered here tonight on the eve of what would have been his 102nd birthday to celebrate his life. Those of you who knew him and attest to Tambo did all and did not in pursuit of fame, acclaim or glory. In his lifetime, Tambo was imprisoned, persecuted, exiled, and live his life in constant expectation of assassination in pursuit of one goal and one goal only. In his speech he delivered in 1987 at the Georgetown University. I quote, we seek to create a united democratic and non-racial society. We have a vision of South Africa in which black and white should live and work together as equals in conditions of peace and prosperity. Using the power you derive from the di di discovery of the truth about racism in South Africa, you will help us remake 
our part on the world into a corner of the globe in which all humanity can be proud, close quote. One of the people who firmly believed in, those, in these words and worked closely with O.R. Tambo to help us remake our part in the world was none other than the Congresswoman Maxine Waters. She will be delivering her lecture this evening. She will be delivering a lecture this evening. And uh, obviously, I think uh, as the South Africans that are here, we should actually be able to have a look at issues that would actually combine the history of Tambo and Maxine. Earlier today, we had uh, a very interesting dis discussion of uh, the Congresswoman and our mother, Umama U. Mabuza, Lindy Mabuza Ambassador. Those of us who are here knew that attest to Tambo to all he did not pursue fame or glory. Tambo was imprisoned and persecuted. Let me actually further indicate that we knew how busy you were as members of the Congress and one of the most vocal component of Trump uh, administration, I might add. Though you uh, preserve here in this evening, you have once again shown your continued commitment to Oliver and Adelaide Tambo, including South Africa. In, in his loving and impassionate tribute to Oliver Tambo at the funeral, his lifelong friend and comrade Nelson Mandela said, open quote, people of the world, here lie before you the body of a man who is tied to me by an umbilical cord which cannot be broken. We say he has departed, but can we allow him to depart while we live? Can we say Oliver Tambo is no more while we walk this solid earth? Close quote. This is why the foundation is, was established in 2011 to protect and promote, preserve the legacy of both Oliver and Adelaide Tambo through the Im implementation of the community-based program that seek to instill the Tambo values into new generation of young people. We aim to continue to work with the Tambo started by using the legacy, inspire and educate. Since the establishment of the foundation in 2011, the Mutsipe Foundation has made a generous annual donation that allowed us to continue to try and realize the Tambo vision for an equal society. The board and staff of the foundation are deeply grateful to you for this. It is due to this support that we are able to launch, at, uh, launch Encantolo School project which was inspired by Tambo's commitment to gender parity and rights. This project helps keep 1,400 girls in Tambo's birthplace at Encantolo in a school by donating sanitary pets. In addition, both boys and girls receive sexual education and health talks. I am also extremely pleased to welcome our friends from APSA this evening. We have walked a long, fruitful road with APSA in the past five years in our partnership, continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you to Sazini, Tiati, Viwe, Mpo, the APSA team in partnership with the Corporate Citizenship Division of APSA, who are platinum sponsors of this event. We intend to reach even more of our people, particularly youth, women, and people with disability. I would like to welcome the CEO of Telcom as well and thank them for showing support to the foundation for the number of years. 
to you we are most grateful. 2018 saw the passing of many veterans and stalwarts who were inspired, mentored, and worked closely to, with Tambo. We lost true revolutionaries, great giants of the liberation movement, Winnie Madigizela Mandela, Zola Squeya, Edi Funde, Agnes Msimango, Hugh Masikela, Mendi Msimango, Billy Mudise, and Kiara Petsui Hosisile, to name but a few. We salute you. With this great giant's departure, we lost a wealth of knowledge and the history of our liberation movement in general, and about Oliver Tambo specifically, under whom they all served for decades. Indeed, their passing may be motivation behind the establishment of the passing of the Baton Conference held in July 2019. This engagement bring together 16 to 25 year olds from Ekuruleni area to give them an opportunity to learn from those who are mentored, inspired, and espoused the values of Oliver Tambo. As the foundation, we came to the realization that we have responsibility to ensure that these lessons are continuously passed on from the generation to generation not merely so that the youth can exalt Tambo's name, but so that we can create a generation of Tambo's that leaves his principles. In years, Tambo's month celebrating have indeed been exciting and have done much to entrench the legacy of Oliver Tambo into consciousness of the South African population. The highlight of the calendar is, of course, the memorial lecture. This event has already served to achieve one of our objectives of the foundation, namely to highlight the importance of the values of which Tambo was famed, humility, integrity, ethical leadership, and unity. We are confident that by the end of this evening, after listening to the words of the Congresswoman Walter, we will have achieved an additional goal of ours to fittingly honor the commemorate Oliver Reginald Tambo as a visionary freedom fighter, strategist, diplomatic par excellence, mathematicians, fierce legal mind and man whose legacy will forever live in our midst most secret national documents, the Constitution of South Africa. Long may he live. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, what we should have done right at the top of the show is acknowledge the members of the Tambo family who are with us this evening. Thank you so much for sharing your parents with us, and thank you for allowing us to use your family's legacy to debate, question, expand our legacy as a country. We appreciate you, and thank you for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge, yes, of course, of course. Hey, by the way, I'm short. Why am I standing here? I'd also like to point out, ladies and gentlemen, that right at the top, those gorgeous young people who accompanied Timothy Muloy in the rendering of our national anthem are not the Navy children. They are, in fact, the South African Air Force children. There are black babies who are Air Force babies in 2019. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming one of our sponsors to the stage, Chief of Staff from ABSA, Ms. Theo Mota. Good evening to everyone.
everyone. I'm also short, but I'm wearing heels, um, especially for this purpose. <laughs> Recognizing honorable guests, Mayor Masina, honorable mayor of the city of Akulileni, Dali, Rachel, and Zelani Tambo, members of the Tambo family and Chukudu family, Mrs. Sophie Williams de Brain, veteran freedom fighter, the ambassador of Nigeria, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, chairperson, trustees, and CEO of the Oliver and Ad Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Honorable guests and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of APSA, I'd like to welcome you again to the sixth Oliver Tambo Memorial Lecture. It's truly quite humbling for me personally to be here and quite an honor um, to be here on this joyous occasion as we pay tri tribute to an, an honor a revolutionary giant and an intellectual. So as part of APSA's strategic engagement focus, we partner with a lot of public and civil society organizations, such as the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. And the purpose there really is to help drive and promote social cohesion and inclusive growth. As a proudly African bank, with, with, where we have an existence in 12 countries on the continent, we have a proud heritage. Um, which spans over 100 years um, on the continent. So we are really proud that we, are, we have been invited and have been able to be part of this, um, of this lecture today. We, we are actually well positioned to be enablers um, and to, to be conveners of like-minded people, ideas and resources um, to help our customers reimagine their futures and to ensure that they bring the possibilities of this continent to life. As we look to the future, we strive to play a shaping role in society. So as part of our strategy for APSA, we say that we would like to play a shaping role in society and not just be an, an, a passive member of society. Um, and part of that, we believe, is that we have a critical role to play in equipping the new generation of ethical and conscious young African leaders of tomorrow because it is in their hands that the future of this continent sits, they will enable it to grow and thrive. When you walked in and registered this evening, you would have all received a booklet that looks like that. You'll see on the front of the booklet that there are such words as respect, courage, sacrifice, leadership, printed on the backdrop of the jubilant image of Comrade O.R as he was popularly referred as. These are not mere words of men, but these are rather expressions of the way in which he lived his life. A true son of the soil, and one of the most, most substantial and influential leaders our revolution has produced to date. Comrade O.R. was not only the epitome of the struggle for liberation for South Africa, he also had a fierce love for all Africans and had a consciousness for women's rights at a time when many actually dismissed it as a distraction. His views on the emancipation of women and his recognition of the vital role that women played in the struggle are actually quite well documented. I'm told that he affectionately referred to women in MK as the flowers of the revolution or the mighty few, as there were very few women in the camps uh, compared to their ma male counterparts at the time. Comrade O.R. firmly believed that women have a duty to liberate men from antique concepts and attitudes about place and role of women in society and in the development and direction of our revolutionary struggle. And this is exactly what Congresswoman Maxine Waters has achieved with such sterling success. In her illustrious career spanning more than 40 years and 15 terms in office. In the words of Comrade O.R., she, she has and still does see it as her duty to liberate men from antique concepts and attitudes. As demonstrated in how she dealt with Treasury Secretary Stephen Mewton um, when he appeared to be disrupting her during her question time when she had her five minutes. She simply stopped him by saying, reclaiming my time. Yes. 
This being a standard um, house procedural rule, these three words, reclaiming my time, have become a hashtag and a call to action for all women to actually stand up for what they deserve and to stand up for themselves. In 2018, Time magazine honored both 19-year-old American actress, model, and activist Yara Shahidi and Congressman woman uh, Maxine Waters for their influence. The magazine's iconic most influential list, Yara was in the top 30 most influential teens, and Congresswoman Waters was one of Time's 100 most influential people of 2018. So at the time, Yara wrote about her admiration for Congresswoman um, Waters, whom she calls affectionately Auntie Maxine. In her tribute, Yara said, Auntie Maxine is adored and admired by people who care about social justice and is in so eloquent in letting the world, and particularly white men of King Congress, who dare to test her acumen, know that she's not there for any nonsense. From her reclaiming my time to leading a movement to impeach President Trump, she says what many of us are actually thinking. She has the brevity to actually say it. And she reminds us every day that we are worthy of any space that we occupy. Yes, ladies. It is true, women, we are all worthy of the spaces that we occupy. We find ourselves in a such sad situation in our country where our women and our children don't feel safe. And we, we can't carry on like this. And all we say is that it's the role of everyone in society to actually put a stop to this. It's critical that we continue to advocate for women's empowerment and raise awareness in order to change the gender-based norms and practices that continue to keep many women confined to the margins of our society and our economy. It is what Comrade Orr would have wanted, it is what he would have advocated for, and if he was still alive, it's what he would be still activating for. I trust that you'll all enjoy your evening, and thank you very much for allowing EPSA the opportunity to partner with the Foundation. Thank you. The greatest shock of my life, there were 600 people dead. But that, that is the price we had to pay. So they risked their national independence, they risked their sovereignty, they risked their economy. They risk actually their whole future by fighting apartheid. Very few situations in history where you've seen so many poor countries who just come out into freedom and then throw their lot in with a liberation struggle. Ladies and gentlemen, now please join me in welcoming our next speaker, CEO of the National Research Foundation, Dr. Mulapo Kobel. Ladies and gentlemen, all the dignitaries have been acknowledged, but allow me a special moment to acknowledge in our presence our elders. We wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for them. 2017, ladies and gentlemen, was a special year. Special for many occasions, special as we celebrated and commemorated the centenary of the birth of Oliver Tambo. A lot has already been said about him. Fierce intellectual, lawyer, modest revolutionary, and many other adjectives that can be used. 
What is less known, and Duma raised it a little bit, was that he was a mathematician. He was a mathematics and science teacher. In as much as we need lawyers, diplomats, and many other disciplines. <laughs> we also need engineers, mathematicians, statisticians, scientists, the people who will advance our economy and our society. That is why in 2017, our Minister of Science and Technology at the time and the current Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, uh, Dr. Naledi Pando, got her PhD last year, proposed that our national science system, the country's national science system, must honor OWA. This led to a partnership between the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation and the National Research Foundation. The partnership evolved and culminated with the intention to establish the O.R. Tambo Africa Research Chairs Initiative in recognition and in memory of Oliver Tambo's contribution to science and mathematics education, an absolutely important component of us. <laughs> the Research Chairs Initiative thus aims to honor a leading figure in the development of African unity. We all know the role that he played uh, in African unity. To have a catalytic impact on the development of research enterprise on, on our continent, our own continent, Africa. And to contribute to knowledge production and human capacity for Africa's development. Together with the foundation, the Canadian International Research and Development Center, the National Research Foundation and the sister agencies of 15 countries on our continent, we will be awarding later this, no, in next year, early next year, 10 research chairs for an initial period of five years at a cost of three million per year. <laughs> These chairs will be hosted not at the University of Johannesburg, but will be hosted at universities on our continent outside of our republic. The chairs are expected to advance knowledge, to train and mentor masters and doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows, and to undertake research that contribute to societal development. However, today, Today, ladies and gentlemen, we announce the launch of the OA Tambo Scholarship linked to these African research chairs. In support of our collective, and when I say collective, it is not the National Research Foundation and the Adelaide and uh, Oliver uh, Tambo Foundation only, but all of us, our collective to commitment to advancing the gender agenda of gender equality. We will be allocating 55 prestigious scholarships exclusively to African female PhD students attached to these chairs. <laughs> the foundation, and that's the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, working with ourselves have already raised funds for 10 scholarships. We would like to increase the 55 to 100. And in this room, there are people with deep pockets, <laughs> with medium pockets, with shallow pockets. Every contribution counts. And we call on all of us to join us in this endeavor. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, the National Research Foundation is truly honored, privileged, to partner with the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation in continuing to foster and promote unity among our people on our continent. We must remember South Africa is part of the continent. We cannot be seen to be apart. We are particularly grateful to the foundation and to the Tambo family in particular, who have lent the name of OA and we cherish that lending and respected hugely to this initiative which recognize African, and I stress that, 
African scientific excellence and supporting African women in science for the development of our continent. I thank you and I look forward to your support. President Reagan has fought long and hard to prevent Congress from imposing new economic sanctions against South Africa. Recently, even leaders of his own party begged him to stop. He didn't. Today, he lost. The Senate joined the House in overriding Mr. Reagan's veto. And if the United States could pass through that act, it had rippling effect. General Motors pulled out, Ford pulled out. A number of the pharmaceutical companies pulled out, the entertainment companies pulled out, the banks pulled out. It was a blow because one felt desperately isolated. And that left a sinking feeling, and, 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 and certainly in my stomach. What kind of a woman leaves? What kind of a woman stays. What kind of a woman kills? And what kind of a woman prays? What kind of a woman sells her children when she can't find a way? What kind of a woman sleeps with fulfillment at the end of the day? What kind of a woman moves with purpose, doing the silent work of change? What kind of a woman sleeps her way to success, while another wouldn't do the same? What kind of a woman is hungry? What kind of a woman is dying? What kind of a woman is drowning? And what kind of a woman is thriving? Who is scared to walk these streets at night? Scared to sleep without the lights. Scared one of her own kind will try to take her life. Scared of what's coming around the corner. Scared to open the door. Scared that the ceiling will cave in and that we'll all fall through the floor. And maybe then there'll be no hurting and competing anymore. What kind of a woman asks for more? and believes it's her right to be provided for. What kind of a woman dreams? What kind of a woman sleeps? What kind of a woman practices the art of living what she preaches? What kind of a woman believes that her highest desire is within the scope of her reach? What kind of a woman knows that what she needs to learn is exactly what she teaches. What kind of a woman conforms to her own norms as society chastises her for the codes she breaches? What kind of a woman looks at the image in the mirror with compassion for who she sees? What kind of a woman believes she'll be given what she needs the second she falls to her knees? What kind of a woman walks through life with a set of changing eyes to shift the reality she perceives? What kind of a woman laughs with ease, looks at the sea, and knows that it lives within her. It flows through her infinitely. Thank you so much, Kitty Peta. And with these words, we give thanks, Congressman Maxine Waters, for you making the great trek across the seas to come and be with us and tell us the truth. 
This woman, our keynote speaker for the sixth annual Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation lecture, began her political career when she entered the California State Assembly in 1976, of course, the same year as our youth uprisings. As soon as she entered, she started fighting the state of California to divest from South Africa. And she remained a friend of the struggle for our liberation. In the 1980s, she met with Oliver Tambo when President Reagan was busy calling our liberation movements terrorists. She remained our friend. She entered the U.S. Congress in 1991. She is currently serving her 15th term in Congress. making her the most senior of a Congress that inclu currently includes an unprecedented number of women of color and black women in particular. She is the most senior of the 12 women in Congress. And in her nearly 30 years as a Congresswoman, she has remained an advocate of social justice, uh, an ardent oppose, uh, opposer of injustice, a champion of women, a champion of people of color, in particular black people, poor people, working class people. She openly opposed the Iraqi war. She openly called, yes, yes. She openly opposed George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr., calling George Bush Sr. a racist. She remained in communication with Cuba while the U.S. had an embargo against Cuba. And thanked Fidel Castro for continuing to give a place of safety for Asada Shakur and other political prisoners. And of course we know we know that she has cussed Donald Trump out on the best of occasions that we have seen and saved thanks to the internet. And she is fresh from the storm, from raining fire and thunder on a whole billionaire, Mark Zuckerberg, pouring him with buckets and buckets of water for the nefarious activities of Facebook. I mean, which I am a part of and I am debating that within myself, Congresswoman Waters or Auntie Maxine, as we affectionately refer to you behind your back and in your face. We love you. This is a time in South Africa where people are feeling very disillusioned. We are scared. We are sad. Um, it is a country that is filled with extraordinary gifts, talents, resources, money, wealth, materially and in the form of our people. But that exists against the backdrop of a lot of pain and inequality and confusion right now. And we ask you as a friend of our country to speak into that complexity with your fire and your truth that we love and admire so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Thank you so very, very much. What an introduction. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am so enjoying this evening. The children, the dancers, until I'd rather just sit there and continue to enjoy. But I suppose I made a commitment and I must keep it, but I want you to please um, give my husband, Ambassador Sidney Williams, a round of applause for accompanying me on this trip. I'd first like to say, President Ramaphosa, 
former President Thabo Mbeki, who may not be present, but I always honor uh, the leadership of this country when it's the right leadership. <laughs> Family members of President Oliver Tambo, current and former ministers and government officials, Foundation Chair Dumi Nkosi, Foundation CEO Zenge Ziwei MC Mong, Foundation patrons, organizers of the 1956 Women's March, Sophie Dubrain, members of MK's Lutili, and friends throughout South Africa. It is truly a special honor to present this year's Oliver Tambo Memorial Lecture. I thank Oliver and Adelie Tambo Foundation for this opportunity to join you in celebrating the life and legacy of President Oliver Reginald Tambo. It is profoundly meaningful to join you in reflecting on how OR's passion and aspirations molded a nation, setting it on a new course as an egalitarian democracy governed by ethical leadership. Now, I want you to know, in responding to the invitation uh, to this Oliver and Adelie Tambo Foundation, it really did have special meaning for me. Not only did I get an opportunity to spend some time with my dear friend, Lindiwi Mabusa, who was also the representative for the ANC that I met in Washington, D.C. many years ago. Uh, of course, it gives me the opportunity to support this important Oliver and Adelaide Foundation, preserving the legacy of Oliver and Adelaide's tremendous ANC leadership in the fight against the unconscionable apartheid. And also, I'm afforded a little time in this special country to reminisce a bit and even to gloat because on June 16, 2014, in Pretoria, President Thabo Mbeki presented me with the order of the Companions of O.R. Silver Award, one of the most prestigious awards granted by the South African government. I want you to know that I received this great honor uh, because of my work on behalf of the people of South Africa. Throughout my career, especially my role in fighting against the apartheid regime here in South Africa. This was a defining moment in my life. President Mbeki was a very special human being that I met during the struggle. He was a young, brilliant economic expert and leader. He was traveling throughout the world. He was planning, strategizing, negotiating, and for many, he was already the face of the new potential leadership of South Africa. And I want you to know, as you all realize, he was a student of Oliver Tambo and Nelson Mandela. And I was not at all surprised when he followed Nelson Mandela's presidency and was elected president of South Africa. And I want you to know, I shall always appreciate and honor him for honoring me. And I thank him for his service to South Africa. Would you please give him a big round of applause? And so, in addition to national leaders and so many other dignitaries, we are graced with many young South Africans in this hall. We are graced with many of them, and many more are listening and watching from their cities and their townships. I offer an especially warm welcome to South Africa's young adults, teenagers, and children, because this foundation was crafted to serve you, providing historical and moral context. I want you to know 
that for me, you are very special. And Oliver Tombow's legacy was to help prepare you for your future leadership roles. President Tombow tore down walls of exclusion and chiseled away calcified oppression so that you don't have to. He dismantled institutions built on hatred so that you would never have to endure them. He penetrated hearts and minds with love and truth to lay the pavement for you to walk a righteous path toward an egalitarian society. He dedicated his life to his homeland, embracing virtuous values and ethical leadership so that you will inherit a just and equitable nation that is receptive to your input this was President Tambo's gift to you, his progeny, South Africa's resplendent and promising youth. I want you to know that OR built the ANC's mission on a foundation of humanitarian values that gave him and the ANC the moral high ground. His undeniable virtues countered the hegemony of the destructive, diabolical apartheid regime. His values were powerful because they were and remain fundamental human rights. They emanated from England's Magna Carta, the USA's Declaration of Independence, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, South Africa's adaptation of the OAU's African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and other blueprints of fundamental principles. OR internalized these guideposts as he molded a framework that propelled his and the ANC's actions. He exemplified his vision for a basic ethical system of government defined by equality, justice, empathy, humility, selfishness, integrity, dignity, honesty, gender equality, opportunity, respect, and peace for everyone in South Africa. Tambo's selfishness and dedication to humanitarian values were consecrated at his funeral in the magnificent eulogy by President Nelson Mandela, who stated, and I quote, Oliver lived because he had surrendered his very being to the people. He lived because his very being embodied love, an idea, a hope, an inspiration, a vision. I say that Oliver Tambo has not died because the ideals of freedom, human dignity, and a colorblind respect for every individual cannot and will not perish. We can see that we have in it our power to remake South Africa into what you wanted it to be, free, just, prosperous, at peace with itself and with the world, quote, unquote. For decades, with Mandela's liberty denied and Tambo at liberty to be the voice of the people, Tambo articulated the dreams of black South Africans. Great responsibility was placed on OR's shoulders, which he fulfilled with wisdom, grace, and purpose, knowing that his words would shape the ANC's destiny. The values that OR established for his country's future reinforced the movement and swayed allies and nations abroad to join the anti-apartheid crusade. Tambo's values, leadership, and unrelenting perseverance rightly earned him a place in the global pantheon of visionary, humanitarian, principal leaders. His place is secure alongside St. Francis of Assisi, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa and Dalai Lama, and of course, his brother and compatriot, Nelson Mandela. President Tambo was a messenger, but he didn't just deliver the message of South Africa's future. He was its chief architect. He was an advocate. He didn't just ask for help. He presented a moral and practical imperative that dissolved opposition. OR was a negotiator, but he didn't just ask people to take a leap of faith. He demonstrated the viability of his vision. He was the leader in exile of the ANC. But he didn't just luxuriate in foreign lands. He remained focused on his purpose, his homeland, his people, and his yearning to rejoin them.
OR's values and his determination to weave them into the fabric of his homeland are central to his legacy. They are his bequests to everyone, for all to administer and augment responsibility. OR, the torch of freedom, equality, and ethical leadership. When the time came, he passed the torch to other leaders. He equipped them with the framework on which the country, country should be governed. Today's leaders are the custodians of OR's bequest, as successive generations of leaders will in turn become the caretakers. The society that OR inspired takes root when each era of leaders enhances it. Because of his work, young South Africans 25 years old and younger, have only known a country that enshrines equality, justice, and peace. They're certainly well aware of the tragedies and trauma inflicted by the preceding tyranny, but they are not subjected to it. Just as Tambo and his compatriots overcame horrific obstacles, future leaders will be called upon to advance emerging goals and develop solutions to new challenges. Rather than fight for freedom, today's youth will be free to fight for better standards in a truly egalitarian society. OR's belief in the leadership of younger generations dates back to his own youth. As a 24-year-old, an injustice at his university inspired him to get involved. He became the chairperson of the Students' Committee at his residence and was active in the Students' Representative Council. Soon he was participating in discussions with other young intellectuals, including Walter Sisulu, Anton Limbidi, and Tanubani, and other students from Tambo School. Another student, Nelson Mandela. Soon after, OR elevated his focus to the national arena. He believed the ANC should take stronger action against white rule. So rather than passively negotiating for a few crumbs from the table, in 1944, Tambo with Mandela, Sisulu, and Lumbidi and others founded the ANC's Youth League. They aim to expand the ANC's appeal and relevance to marginalized constituencies and young South Africans. Their defiant stance resonated, and the ANC's membership multiplied. In the 1948 election, Africana Control Nationalist Party vowed to expand and enforce apartheid against what they antagonistically doomed of the black threat. Their blatantly racist campaign sought to inflame fears among whites only electorate. They won control of the government and the oppression of blacks absolutely intensified. The white supremacist National Party escalated their racist aggression by enacting laws that further eroded non-white civil and human rights. These included the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, that criminalized interracial marriages, the Population Registration Act that required everyone over 16 to register with the government and declare their race, the Suppression of Communism Act that falsely linked apartheid opponents with communism to justify persecution of blacks, the Group Areas Act that determined where blacks and other white, non-whites would reside and own homes, and so, the Bantu Education Act that restricted black access to education. And then there was the Natives Act, or pass laws, that required blacks to carry domestic passports, prohibiting access to areas designated as whites only. Pass laws were particularly dehumanizing and incendiary. They allowed the government to arrest and prosecute blacks simply for being somewhere without having engaged in any criminal activity. As OR stated, and I quote, your very existence is an illegality. In 1949, as the government began enacting these repressive laws, Tambo, Sisulu, Mandela, and others countered with resistance. They developed the program of action 
with nonviolent strategies to challenge apartheid through a national liberation movement. As the government became increasingly repressive, Tambo was instrumental in organizing the Defiance Campaign and the Congress Alliance. The ANC adopted confrontational tactics, including deliberate violation of these outlandish edicts and occasional boycotts. Thousands of blacks were arrested for violating whites only restrictions on drinking fountains, train seating, and waiting rooms. Tambo and Mandela joined forces to create South Africa's first black law firm partnership, litigating a torrent of cases all against the government's oppression. Many blacks sought their help, for as Tambo described it, petty infringements of statutory law that no really civilized society would punish with imprisonment. To be unemployed is a crime. To be landless is a crime. To view African beer is to drink it. Or to use the proceeds to supplement the meager family income is a crime. To cheek a white man can be a crime. To live in the wrong area, an area dedicated, white or Indian or colored, is a crime for Africans, quote unquote. Tambo was involved in developing the Freedom Charter that was adopted by the ANC back in 1955. One of its key principles was that everyone living in South Africa was entitled to civil rights. And so, human rights and legal rights, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or gender. Decades later, Tambo reflected on the Freedom Charter by saying, and I quote, it is the people as a whole, black and white, who rule and run the country. They live and work together as fellow citizens. It is a democracy in which the majority decides, but it is not a black majority we are looking for. It is a majority of the people of South Africa as a whole. The Freedom Charter is an instrument of peace in South Africa, a prescription to end racist and imperialist domination over Southern Africa, to fight for the demands elaborated in the Charter, and if need be, if need be, to die in that fight. It is therefore to fight and die for, and peace for an end to a system that at once brutal, incorrigible, and incomparably inhuman, quote unquote. The principles underlying reconciliation, which materialized decades later, stem from the Freedom Charter. The Charter proclaimed that South African would be an egalitarian society belonging to all of its residents, every race, color, ethnicity, and religion with full rights and protections for all. I reference these events from the 1940s and 1950s for two reasons. First, they are watershed moments in the country's history. Second, each of OR's actions during that despondent era influenced his values that would guide him in the decades ahead. He shaped the events and the events shaped him. The challenges he navigated during his political ascendancy fused him into his political DNA which became part of South Africa's. OR sought equality and rights for everyone in a just and egalitarian South Africa, including for whites. He fought oppression in the courts, yet recognized politics and resistance as the inevitable tools for social change. He pursued peace, yet accepted that conflict was necessary when government ordained violence and killing required self-defense. President Lututuli recognized OR's unique skills that equipped him to be the ideal international spokesperson, alliance builder, and advocate for the ANC against apartheid. OR accepted the mandate with full authority to speak and act on behalf of the ANC, even though it meant separation from the land and the people he loved, and living in constant fear of risk to his and his family's safety. Six days after the Sharpeville massacre in 1960, Tambo escaped the crackdown and fled to London. O.R. and his wife Adelaide were the nucleus of South Africa's international presence. O.R. 
was seen as the glue that held the anti-apartheid movement together. As the head of the ANC's external mission and as acting president following President Lututu's death, OR directed ANC actions worldwide. He established diplomatic missions in, oh, 27 countries and advocated in many more. He achieved the expulsion of the apartheid regime from the British Commonwealth. He persuaded the United Nations to adopt resolutions declaring apartheid a crime against humanity. Although he operated abroad, he was always focused on his homelands, workers and unemployed, families and youth, urban homeless and rural poor, and others facing racist oppression. Tambo's daily decisions charted the ANC's course on matters great and small. Sometimes he sought consensus in a consultative process, and sometimes he directed actions. He decided who would serve in diplomatic missions and who would pursue advanced degrees to serve South Africa's future needs. He set fundraising strategies to facilitate ANC, uh, ANC operations. He built support for the ANC by selfishly making Nelson Mandela's freedom the symbol and rallying cry of the movement. OR orchestrated all four pillars of the movement. He decided when diplomacy was useful and when resistance was beneficial. He decided when both were insufficient and strong responses were needed. With the Soweto uprising, he decided it was time for mass mobilization. When he determined in 1985 that confrontation had to be escalated, he declared, and I quote, we have to make apartheid unworkable and our country ungovernable. OR designed an extensive network of alliances with international organizations, supportive countries, foreign nationals, and domestic influences, like the South African United Democratic Front, Later, he appointed a commission of ANC legal experts to draft a constitutional framework and based on core values for a future ANC-led government. He attended meetings to ensure that key principles were addressed, but he deferred the drafting of the Constitution to a later time when it could be undertaken on South African soil and all sectors of society could be enfranchised in the process. Tambo allocated personnel and resources for MK, which was initiated after the Sharpeville massacre to combat the apartheid regime's terrorism. When Mandela and others were imprisoned during the Rivonia trials, OR took charge of MK's operations. And even though he led the MK, Tambo remained a man of peace, viewing militant responses as a last resort when government terrorism and immoral atrocities compel protection of the oppressed. Chief, as Tambo was known within the MK, decided where and when to establish training camps, deploy forces, initiate offenses, coordinate with frontline states, and conduct covert operations. Chief's stature and proven judgment bolstered his decisions when challenged. Some in the MK objected when after the regime's murderous attacks against the ANC in the frontline states, Chief refused to match the regime's brutality. He chose instead to take the moral high ground, his decision to adhere to the ANC's broader strategy for global support was vindicated. As the focal point of the ANC's global presence from their London home, OR and Adelaide endured hardships and many sacrifices. Yet, they maintained their stalwart leadership of worldwide efforts and coordination of South Africans abroad. Decades later, Abraham described OR as, I quote, a man who surrendered his very being to the people. OR's travels were taxing. He traversed the globe, often traveling to New York to update the UN on crimes by the apartheid regime, to the Soviet Union and China 
to raise funds to Scandinavian countries for diplomatic support, to African countries for OAU conferences and ANC meetings, and to many other countries to expand the ANC's reach and relationships. The stress and the pressure of OR's duties, his travels and daily peace as a leader of both the ANC and the MK manifested in health problems. He suffered a minor stroke in the early 1980s, a major stroke in 1989, and a third stroke in 1991. The 89 stroke forced OR to rely heavily on his deputies and protégés like Thabo Mbeki prior to Madiba taking the helm after his release from Robben Island. The Tambos faced financial pressures during the 1960s and 70s and 1980s. Money was scarce, and they barely had enough to afford basic necessities, as OR dealt with matters akin to a head of state. Adelaide often worked double shifts as a nurse to pay the bills. Even as OR was traveling, Adelaide often hosted South Africans who travel to London, whether they be ANC officials or students. The Tambos withstood long periods of separation when OR's missions compelled him to be away from their London home. One such occasion was in 1987 when OR traveled to America to the Los Angeles community that I represent. His visit was like a victory tour celebrating the 1986 enactment of legislation that I offered and authored to divest assets from South African companies that were sustaining apartheid. We hosted OR for a ceremony that stretched Trinity Baptist Church beyond its capacity. Our community expressed its great admiration of him and he expressed his gratitude for our solidarity with the ANC's cause. For many years, I advocated for divestiture in city halls and picketed at shale oil stations and Cougaron dealers. I saw how actions taken in my own California affected South Africa when I found that our state's pension funds had invested $12 billion in South African banks oil and mining companies and other industries, I saw an opportunity to shift the balance of power. Since divestment of these assets would intensify the economic strain on the apartheid regime, I drafted legislation to do just that. Sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, when my bill became law, it tightened the screws on the oppressors and began reducing their money flow to a drip. Meanwhile, I chaired the Free South Africa Movement in California, spent lots of time, of course, in Los Angeles, an affiliate of Randall Robinson's Trans Africa. I organized and led marches opposing apartheid, supporting the ANC, and calling for Nelson Mandela's freedom. I had a big laugh last night with Lindiwe Mabuza. I got so carried away at one of the rallies where I was speaking, I announced that I was a member of the ANC. <laughs> Thousands came to rallies and filled the streets with chants of free the people, free the land. When we protested and picketed at South Africa's consulate, I was arrested along with others, which drew even more people to our cause. I had another life with Lindy, when Lindy Way last night, when I told her about the fact that I had traveled from very warm Los Angeles to very cold Washington, D.C., and I had sandals on, and my feet were freezing, I was so glad to be arrested, to get into a warm place, <laughs> and so they don't know while they thought, and somehow they were punishing me, they were only helping me <laughs> to get warm and to feel good about being arrested. The effect of California's law was amplified when 40 other states followed and considered divestiture legislation. Through economic means, we were doing what we could to bankrupt the apartheid regime by withdrawing the capital on which they relied.
While my bill was progressing, my dear friend and colleague, the late Congressman Ron Dellums, was fighting for national legislation to impose sanctions on the apartheid oppressors. His bill became law by overriding President Reagan's veto. It was very meaningful that our bills became law just one week apart and combined impact was powerful. Both of our bills exemplified the international economic pressure that Tambo envisioned as part of his Four Pillars strategy. Our bills accelerated OR's efforts to make South Africa ungovernable. OR's visit to Los Angeles was memorable and heroic. Having been inspired by OR's values-based leadership for many years, I was honored to share his ideas, develop plans, and spend time with such a great visionary and wonderful human being. His personal warmth, concentrated attention, insightful observations, and his lightness of spirit generated a connection that felt like we had been friends for many years. He exuded a relaxed confidence and charisma that drew people to him, hoping that his personal nature might be contagious. Throughout our conversations, it was clear that the strategic wheels of his mind were humming at a rapid pace that was for him quite natural. His extraordinary acumen was unmistakable, as his broad expertise and adroit analysis could not be cloaked. My talks with OR were humbling, yet enlivening, grounded, yet empowering, as he embodied the potential of optimism coupled with perseverance. I'd been organizing demonstrations against apartheid long before meeting OR, but his validation of our efforts encouraged many more people to become involved and worked even harder to eradicate that horrific system. And so, the demolition of apartheid and abolition of racism were not the only goals that OR and I shared. Motivate, motivated by the same values, our careers were defined by fierce commitment to enforcement of equal justice, civil rights, equal opportunity, gender equality, and an egalitarian society with an ethical system of government. Disdain for racism and discrimination against our black and brown brothers and sisters has driven many of my legislative initiatives in the California State Assembly and in Congress. In California, I pass laws for equal access to housing, equal opportunity in professions that had been excluding people of color, and criminal justice reforms to eliminate bias from police and judicial conduct. In Congress, I spearheaded efforts to increase minority-owned businesses, participation in federal contracting, terminate the use of redlining that equates to housing discrimination, and eliminate barriers to voting that marginalize communities of color. The values that OR and I shared place me on the front lines of many other movements and reforms. I believe rights and protections should be accorded to all people, all countries as a matter of human rights, including affordable quality health care for everyone, especially maternal health and pediatric care, affordable medications, especially the HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis through full funding of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS to help the 18% of South African adult population that are affected with HIV. Debt relief by fully funding the heavily indebted poor countries initiative that cancels debt to the US and urging other nations to do the same so African countries can invest their resources in healthcare, education, and poverty reduction. Environmental protections to mollify the climate crisis that intensifies droughts and floods, threatens coastal communities, and produces furious damaging storms, environmental justice so that, so that communities of color and low-income communities do not bear the brunt of industrial pollution and toxins that poison our air, water, and land. And so, ladies and gentlemen, election security, very important to me, so that voting systems are secure, elections are fair, 
and our democracies are not threatened by improper conduct. Protection from gun violence by restricting handguns and outlawing aggressive weapons that have been used to commit mass atrocities. Assurance of a decent living wage with decent working conditions for all employees in all industries and the elimination of poverty by providing fresh food to the hungry, housing to the homeless, medical and dental care to those who need it, clothing to those who seek it, education to those who embrace it, and decent jobs with decent wages to those who strive for self-sufficiency. This broad agenda aims to serve all of the world's peoples, similar to the scope of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, initiated under Secretary General Kofi Annan. As President Tambo said in an address to the UN, we seek to liberate not only ourselves, but we also thereby contributing to worldwide independence, democracy, social progress, and peace. This, he said, serving as president of the ANC. South Africa was blessed with the rebirth in the early 1990s by overcoming the very scourge of apartheid. Yet, in those days, were consigned to antiquity. Many challenges arose in the years that followed. An ethical system of government is always, an ethical system of government is always a work in progress through an incremental interactive process. This evolution is embodied in the preamble to the United States Constitution with a message that applies to every nation. Our Constitution begins with, we the people, of the United States in order to form a more, more perfect union. These 15 words speak volumes. First, that phrase asserts that the power stems from the people, not from a monarch or an autocrat. Second, in order to form a more perfect union asserts that it lacks perfection, yet strives for improvement. Third, rather than asp aspiring to form a perfect union, which would be overly optimistic and unattainable. It seeks to form a more perfect union, which falls short of perfection, even as it is improved. Our founders sought progress and the, move, the improvement of each generation to make the country more perfect than it had been, while avoiding the lofty goal of perfection. It seems to me that this concept applies to South Africa amid its current challenges, just that it applies to the United States of America. In both countries, we have come a long way, yet we have a long way to go. We rightly savor our achievements while recognizing the need to overcome obstacles, craft new solutions, and redouble our efforts. Our two countries are even experiencing similar problems today on our parallel routes to form that more perfect union, or our strive for ethical leadership to be infused within the new ANC-led movement. That goal incorporates humility, integrity, dignity, honesty, empathy, equality, and justice for all. These values are lenses to which all actions should be viewed. Ethical leadership also excludes its antithesis, which is corruption. Unlike values such as dignity and integrity, which are subjective, corruption has an objective element. There are no laws delineating what constitutes humility or setting standards for its practice, but there are laws defining corruption with standards of acceptable conduct. President Tambo articulated a vision of a corruption-free South Africa. President Mandela transformed that vision into law and insulated his government from corruption. He tried to anticipate future sources of corruption and prevent them from materializing, but that's an impossible task. No one can forecast everything and deter all risk. South Africa's burgeoning industries created wealth, increased money flow, and built financial relationships. Black economic empowerment welcomed 
black South Africans to take their rightful and overdue place as business owners in the country's prosperous economy and in the public sector. Policies similar to BEE have been a priority for me throughout my career as a legislator. And so I'm delighted to see the successes of BEE in South Africa. Yet, as business and professional opportunities increase, so did opportunities for inappropriate conduct. Ironically, South Africa became the victim of its own success. There were more economic activity than the country could monitor. Without a doubt, the overwhelming majority of businesses conducted their affairs honorably, but those who do not adhere to standards cast a patina of corruption that extends beyond their activities, especially in the minds of skeptics who use it as fodder for hyperextended criticism of BEE inclusion. Strict adherence to standards coupled with transparency is the best way to mute overly eager critics and distractors. The danger of corruption seeking into government brings to mind a famous quote from one of the founders of USA, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. At the Constitutional Convention back in 1787, after the Constitution was approved and signed, Franklin met some citizens when he left Independence Hall. He was asked, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Franklin's, Franklin's legendary response was, a republic if you can keep it. In those few words, he summarized the risk of corruption and a lack of accountability that should be a concern to every country. Let me just break here for a moment and repeat. In those few words, he summarized the risk of corruption and a lack of accountability that should be a concern to every country. It is my focus. It is my agenda. It is what I wake up every morning with. It is what I go to bed with every night. It is what I understand about what is happening in my own country. We have never seen anything like that which we are confronted with today. We have never seen, despite racism, despite marginalization, despite anything that you could possibly describe, we are confronted with a situation that is putting us at risk, a situation that is separating us from all of our allies in the country, in the, in the world, a situation that we believe stands to cause great harm, that is undermining our democracy, a president that does not respect the Constitution, and every day we arise to a new scandal. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm up to the fight. And I am in this fight. And I want you to know that I said to you that being involved in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa was a defining moment in my life and in my career. And I want you to know that the strength and the resilience of Tambo and Mandela and Mbeki and Sisulu and all of those brave men and women has inspired me to the point where I have no fear of anything or anybody. I am prepared every day to engage in the struggle. Well, let me keep going. Another issue, xenophobia is weighing heavily on both of our countries, as well as many others. Over the past decade, European and Southern Asian countries, in addition to the USA and South Africa, have been infected by reprehens reprehensible antipathy toward immigrants. Sometimes even native-born citizens are targeted. In both situations, acrimony is aimed at people who are seen as different from the majority. Like in the United States, the black and brown immigrants and Americans are being vilified by fractious forces, hate-filled xenophobes, create scapegoats, and treat them as others with less legitimacy than the mainstream population. Here in South Africa, 
especially in recent months, foreign nationals from other African countries have been demonized. Economic pressures in bordering states prompted many to try their luck in South Africa. Large numbers of poor immigrants sought jobs, housing, and social services. The competition for limited opportunities amid economic constraints triggered angst and hostility and even violence against people from Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique, and Swaziland at Lesotho. And so, these countries were the frontline states, we can't forget, that aligned with the ANC during apartheid. The ANC, OR, and Madiba were deeply grateful for their support. These countries harbored MK, provided assistance, and lost loved ones in the regime's cross-border raids and kidnappings. That solidarity, solidarity should translate to a warm welcome for these esteemed neighbors. They should not face confrontation, intolerance, or aggression. These are tough times. People from Eastern and Western African countries have also been vilified. This may be a reaction to their apparent prosperity as shop owners and business people amid economic pressures. It may also relate to their geographic distance from the perils of the apartheid regime. And so, Yet, their countries were very supportive of the ANC during that era as allies in the battle for freedom. The violence that claimed lives and forced many Nigerians and others to leave South Africa is unjustifiable, and it just must be stopped. Violence that wears the badge. Thank you. Violence that wears the badge of xenophobia is reminiscence of a bygone era. It is behavior that must be unlearned. And it is not the conduct of an enlightened, free, and appreciative people. We must be mindful of OR's vision for an egalitarian, pan-African society that is at peace within itself and with its neighbors. He would surely be welcoming and respectful to foreign nationals from the frontline states and other African countries that provided vital assistance during his and the ANC's time of greatest need. Another trend, the dramatic escalation of gender-based violence is truly tragic. Recently, against attacks against South African women and girls have been increasing in frequency and severity. The horrific torture, rape, and murder of the 19-year-old University of Cape Town student, Oye Nene, in August, has seared these evils into the national conscience. It is a grave concern that sexual offenses against women in South Africa more than double from 2015 to 2017, surpassing 70,000 in 2017. And those are just the incidents that were reported, with probably many more that were not reported. The number of women and girls killed during that period also more than doubled. Violence against women and girls must be eradicated from every corner and crevice of civilization. It is appalling, intolerable, and never justifiable. Females must be safeguarded from all forms of violence. It should be a priority of every country to ensure our security so that we can pursue fulfilling lives without fear of an attacker lurking around the corner. I applaud President Ramaphosa for his strong statement on September 5th against gender-based violence and the action plan that he delineated to combat that trend. I hope everyone in South Africa will collaborate on that effort. I want you to know uh, that there's something called the Me Too movement that started in the United States. And it was after the inauguration of this president, who clearly uh, does not respect women, and talked about grabbing women by their private parts during the campaign. And so the Me Too movement has gotten stronger and stronger. And it focused a lot of tension on Hollywood. We had heard for years about the so-called casting couch. That's what women had to go through in order to get a part in a movie, in order to be recognized. They had to take place on that casting couch. Well, I want you to know 
women have come alive, have organized, have gotten stronger. And this is not, this is not to demean all men, but we are putting a lot of men in jail. They are being arrested. They are being given time. And the stories that are coming forth about how women have been subjected to this horror, many from the time they were children up through their adulthood, are stories that we really must make sure that we work as hard as we possibly can so that the next generation won't have to hear these stories. Women, it is possible. It is time to tell it, to let the world know what is happening and how women are being treated, violence against women, sexual assaults against women, it must stop. And I know that there are a lot of men who respect us and will join us in this struggle. But even if they don't, if we don't do it for ourselves, we can't expect anybody else to do it for us. So I want you to know that I'm appreciative that gender equity and inclusion were among OR's foundational principles. He insisted on women being full and equal stakeholders with full respect and dignity. He provided opportunities for women at all levels of his operations and advocated for similar efforts to be infused into every aspect of society. This ethic was confirmed by the ANC in 1991 at the National Conference, which I attended. The conference established affirmative action for women as a top priority, and Madiba subsequently put it into practice. Since gender-based violence is diametrically opposed to gender equality, I'm quite certain that OR would be livid about the increase in violence against women and girls. I believe that as he were standing here today, he would demand immediate, effective measures to insulate females from violence and bring perpetrators to justice. And so, in his absence, because you've invited me here today, I make that plea on his behalf, and of course, of my own accord. Despite these challenges, this is a special time in a special place. South Africa has unlimited potential and is poised for greatness. As we breathe in the air of freedom, we are uplifted by the country's success. The more you know about the difficult road that led to the 27th of April, 1994, the more you savor the sweetness and joy of today's South Africa and its future prospects. I was here on that special day in 1994, and I can attest to the jubilation, relief, and optimism that we all felt. Those feelings and the struggle that preceded them form an unbreakable bond for me with all of you, the people of South Africa, and for the country's new egalitarian, ethical, peaceful, and democratic stewardship. Another break right here. Whenever I share the story about the inauguration of Madiba. And I recall sitting on one of the front rows in the way the program was staged. I'll never forget the parade of world leaders that passed by, the world leaders who came to pay homage to Nelson Mandela and to South Africa. And I want you to know that when those airplanes did those maneuvers over the skies, and I knew that they were airplanes in the army of the apartheid regime, and now to see them paying honor to Nelson Mandela, Madiba, who had been in prison, who had sacrificed, whose life had been threatened so often, but who persevered, and he came out of prison, helped to bring South Africa to a point where they understood they had better know and understand 
who could save this country, who could lead this country. I will never forget that experience, and I live with that in my head. It is a guidepost for me in understanding what is possible, what I must be about, and what I must always speak about. And so, let it be known, remembered, and unmistakable that a principal architect of that stewardship is President Oliver Reginald Tombo. In this day, in this day, whether you were based in South Africa or in any country, you knew that the vision and the voice that rang with clarity and purpose, inspiring us to collective action, was O.R.'s. He persuaded the world to recognize what was true and right and act on it. His tools were integrity, dignity, humility, morality, honesty, equality, justice, and selfishness, and he used them like an artisan. As South Africa progresses along the path he paved and looks for new leaders in all sectors and disciplines to build up on his successes, please keep in mind that you don't need a license to use his tools. All of you have them at your side to pick them up and use them. That's all that's required and the will to do so. To those who experience apartheid and who remember the days of oppression and conflict, victory and renaissance, I say thank you, I commend you, and I salute you. You carried the hopes, dreams, and aspirations, not only of your generation, but of those who preceded and followed yours. You not only confronted the forces of evil for the sake of your own survival, you did so for people around the world who believe that good triumphs over evil and look to you as proof of that. You validated the power of perseverance fueled by humanity. You delivered President Tombo's vision, showing the world that it can be achieved and sustained. You planted a beacon that shines in every continent, every country, every township, and is especially visible to oppressed peoples. Your trials and tribulations and eventual successes provide the wind that fills, uh, that fills the sails of O.R.'s legacy. To those who did not experience the apartheid firsthand, who were too young to remember that era, I commend you for recognizing what President Tambo did for you. I applaud your thirst for understanding the world you inherited and the patriots who sacrificed to enable yours in a free society. Some of you might be on a path you like, enthused about your studies or your work, looking forward to your futures. Others may be searching for that path, questioning the future, maybe struggling, frustrated, overlooked by providence, or displeased with the cards you've been dealt. In both cases, it helps you to have a role model, a guide who lights your path, offers lessons, and embodies character, traits that inspire you. I submit that Oliver Tambo is that role model whose own offer, life offers advice for yours. Read about him, learn his lessons, replicate his character, and internalize his values. You will be rewarded. I embrace all of you on your paths, young and old. I walk with you, hand in hand, as you continue to fulfill Oliver Tambo's aspirations and contribute to South Africa's glorious future. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, I share with you that I came from a family where there were 13 children born to a mother who had a third grade education and a father who left soon after I was born. I lived in a community of poor people who worked every day, who believed that there was something better in life for them. They prayed to their God and they got up every morning and they worked hard for every penny that they earn. And so, you were told by the CEO just a few minutes ago that there was a confrontation with Facebook in Zinnenberg. And as I 
worked to get him to come before my committee to tell us what he was doing in establishing a new cryptocurrency called Libra that he was going to house in Switzerland that was going to take over monies of the world and compete with the American dollar. This young, very rich, very brilliant and capable young man who is one of the richest in the world, who has power, who has the biggest database for the peoples of the world, not just in America. As I talk with him even after the hearing, and I thought about from whence I had come, and I remembered my mother and what she had gone through and the hard work that she had done just to feed us and to keep us in school. And I thought to myself, even though she has gone uh, to heaven, she's no longer with us, that her daughter, Maxine Waters, one of 13 children, was staring down one of the richest men in the world, staring him down with no fear, understanding that she had raised me and the people in our communities always believed, no matter our station in life, that we were just as good as anybody else. And so, despite the riches of that young man, and despite the power and the big database, and this big thought about creating this cryptocurrency, I let him know that now I'm in the Congress of the United States and I've earned the right to chair one of the most powerful committees, the Financial Services Committee. And I let him know that I have the gavel and I'm not afraid to use it. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Okay, you make your ancestors and our ancestors very, very proud. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And can I ask for all of us, please, once again, to applaud the members of the Tambo family who are seated here. Without you sharing your family's legacy with us. Tonight wouldn't be possible. So many things in our country wouldn't be possible. We are grateful for you. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. As you sit down, I'd like to call upon the woman whose dream has been made manifest tonight. The CEO of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation has worked tirelessly for the past year to make this happen. I remember her saying, I want to get Maxine Waters to South Africa. I see you, I see Kitty, I see Auntie Maxine. And here it is, we're living it. You did it. Zengesi Wemsimang, CEO of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Please, will you come to the stage? Um, my job is very easy because I'm speaking last um, and therefore I'm positive that all protocol has been observed. Um, but I would like to um, just say thank you very much to my chairman, Dumangosi, the board and trustees of the Tambo Foundation, as well as the Tambo family and the Tsukudu family, which is very, very, very important to us because, as we keep saying, it's the Adelaide, uh, the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Um, so thank you to the families for all of your support and for helping us to make this vision be realized. Um, Congresswoman Waters, thank you very much for coming here. Um, she arrived last night at 5.30 in the afternoon and she will be gone by 5.30 tomorrow. 
Um, and she literally, I was saying earlier, we sent her a fax because I think we're a little bit more forward from an ICT perspective. So we literally got her email, we looked for her email address, couldn't find it, faxed her, and um, her office called us and said, we received your fax. Um, and after that, we got the email address and it was an immediate yes. And this lecture usually takes place. Um, this lecture usually takes place on the 27th, but because she has to be back in Congress um, on Monday in Washington, we moved it one day forward so she could get home. So that just shows the commitment that she has to be here in such a short space of time. I would also um, like to thank all of the people who made this event possible. Um, and there are many, many people who made this event possible. I'm going to start with ABSA. Thank you for all of your support. It's been five years. There's a group of fierce black women at ABSA. And they see us and we see them. And they've been holding our hand and we really, really appreciate the support. So thank you, Viwe, Sazini, Po, and Chachi. Um, I'd also like to thank Telcom, who have supported this event. They've been supporting us for years. Uh, they have a wonderful, very self-effacing CEO who isn't interested in big banners and branding, but rather the values for which the foundation stands and making sure that we are able to do the work that we are trying to do. So thank you very much to Telcom, Sipo, and Pindi. Um, I would also like to thank Birchwood. Uh, we approached them a year ago and knocked on Kevin's, um, the CEO's door and said, we noticed your name, the OR Tumbo Center. Yeah. So do you think you could help us a little bit to put this event together? So thank you very much for that. Um, I would also like to thank Brand South Africa um, who have come on board. They've really been an amazing partner and we're very proud to be working with them. So thank you to Sis Tulusile and uh, Sis Pumeza and the whole team. I'd like to thank the Mutsipe Foundation. They are our partners tonight, um, but they are also one of our biggest sponsors um, and donors. And so we're really, really grateful to them. Every year they come through for us. Um, so thank you for my salary. We appreciate it. I'd like to thank Butsaki and Boot Colgate um, from Safiga Holdings, who have also been amazing partners. Um, yeah, it's amazing to work with you, and thank you for all of your support for this event. Uh, our media partners, SAFM and SABC, um, it means the world to us that you've come on board, particularly because the entire purpose of what we're doing is not just to expose the Tambo values and promote them and inspire people who are sitting in this room who can afford to drive to Birchwood and who have the privilege of being able to even be here, but to all of the people who are listening at home, Tambo's people, the people that he fought for and the people that um, in many ways given the number of strokes he had, he died for. So thank you very much to SAFM and SABC. Thank you also to Clarity Films. Um, the director is Connie Fields, and all of the clips that you saw uh, today are from that movie. Um, our, one of our trustees, Albie Sachs, is the executive producer of that film, which amuses him um, because he can't believe he's the executive producer of a film <laughs> on top of being um, all that LB has been. So thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank um, SA Mint. In 2017, they made um, commemorative coins for us, or for Tambo, in honor of Tambo. And uh, in a few days, they're gonna melt them down. So if you would like to buy some coins, please do, um, from SA Mint. But we'd like to thank Christine and Spongile, 
mainly because through that project they have donated Congresswoman Maxine Waters' gift this evening, which is the full commemorative set of O.R. Tumbo coins. So thank you very much to them. Um, when we were trying to get Congresswoman Waters here, we dealt with the Congressional Ethics Committee, uh, who are not to be taken lightly. So I have said it out loud on a stage. The gift was donated by S.A. Mint. As soon as you get home, please fill in that form that they kept asking us about and declare it. Um, and then um, I'd like to thank Carl um, and the team that helped us put this event together. They worked tirelessly. Um, they helped us with our social media. And we're very, very grateful to them for that. And um, um, Adelaide Tambo liked to quote uh, a Osa song that said, I'll not refuse if I'm asked to perform a task. Um, I love that. I love that. It, it means so much because I think it, it represents who she was, it represents who her husband was, and it represents a lot of the people who support this foundation. So um, I want to again um, thank the NRF. I, I think that you heard Dr. Q clearly, but I'm going to repeat it one more time. If you help us, we can give scholarships in the STEM um, fields to 100 women, 100 black African women from across the continent. So this is the part in the night where I reiterate there are many ways to help us. Um, our uh, website is www.tumbofoundation.org.za and you can get all the information you need from, our, um, from the NRF and this whole project. So please do go there. Also please follow us at, at Tumble Foundation. Um, we would also like you to um, just be, if you need more information about it, send us an email, info at tumblefoundation.org.za. Um, there are many ways to be part of the many projects that we do, so please do um, reach out to us. And last but not least, um, I'd like to thank Natasha, Noloazi, and Kia. Um, the Tambo Foundation consists of three full-time employees who are all women, who are all under the age of 40. <laughs> um, and the, our intern, Kia, who has joined us uh, recently, and they have worked tirelessly. They've been phoning. The time difference between the states LA and Washington, because sometimes Auntie Maxine is in Washington, and other times she's in LA. So sometimes Natasha's calling at 10 p.m. our time, just to make sure everything is in order. Other times, Noloazi is calling at midnight. So without those girls and the Tambo team, uh, we like to think we have the Tambo touch. We hope we do, um, but they made this event possible and it was through their tireless work that we could do all of this tonight. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being part of the Tumble Vision and for helping us through this event to walk closer to realizing it. Have a lovely evening. We have got to keep going. A general build up of a massive force in our country that says no to apartheid. A new South Africa now, today, not tomorrow. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings our formal proceedings to a close. We bid you farewell once again with the talented young people from Moving Into Dance, Mupatong. Go well, thank you, God bless. <laughs>